Charles Mitchell. I was in the U.S. Army from 1960 to 1962. I was not doing anything important at the time, and I figured I'd get drafted pretty soon anyway. Now, I looked at it and I thought, well, if I enlist for three years, uh, there's no way of getting out of three-year commitment. But if I'm drafted, it's only two years. So I went down to the draft board and I said, put my name at the top of the list. So within a short period of time, I got a letter saying, we would like to have you come and join us. They asked me what I wanted to go into, and I thought, well, I might as well go into the infantry. I just read a short time before a book by Audie Murphy called To Hell and Back about his experiences in World War II. So I thought, yeah, I'll do the infantry. Well, they looked at everything, all my tests, and they said, Nah, I think we're going to make you a radio man. Now, after my radio school training, I was uh, sent to Panama in the Canal Zone. <clears throat> now, Panama, even today, is a strategic avenue of transport between the Atlantic and the Pacific. When I arrived in Panama, I had been trained to operate two types of radios. And of course, my sitting in the classroom for four hours a day listening to Morse code for four weeks. And then the other four hours a day, I was learning how to type. Became I became a radio teletype operator. When I got to my assigned post, they put me in a truck and drove me up this jungle trail, the top of the hill. We got out of the truck. Nothing around. Walked up this path, the steel gate, pushed a buzzer, the gate opened. We went in. This was the underground command headquarters for the air defense of the entire Panama Canal. It was headquarters for the air defense battalion, which I became a part of, and that was two types of weapons, Hawk missiles and 40 millimeter quad uh, almost like a tank only instead of a turret with a, an enclosed top and one gun they had four 40 millimeter guns mounted on it for anti-aircraft well this was our battalion two batteries of Hawk missiles and two batteries of 40 millimeter uh, Walker Bulldogs is what they were called. Once I got inside this huge underground facility, they took me through certain areas, took me into this room, well, maybe about one, one eighth the size of this room we're in right here and they showed me this one huge block of equipment and they showed me about nine radios I had never seen before in my life and they said you're responsible for maintaining the operation of all of these radios and there were these strips and on each strip there were connectors and more connectors and more connectors and wires connected to all of them going to cables that went everywhere 
And they said, you're also responsible for making sure that all of those work. I had it pretty easy because as long as everything was working, I could just uh, stay in the radio room and read books, write letters. And my duty was, I would go on at <clears throat> five o'clock in the afternoon and I would be on until seven o'clock the next morning, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then I would go up for 24 hours on Sunday and then it would rotate around to the next week. So I would spend uh, one full day, 24 hours, on either a Saturday or a Sunday. But as I say, it was, it was not that difficult to do as long as everything worked. And the first sergeant said, we have so many people, we really don't need you. So just hang loose, we'll let you know. Two years passed, my status went to standby reserve. After my six years was done, I got that letter saying, thank you for your service. So, going back to your training as a radio operator, like what kind of education did you learn and how long did that take? Well, the radio school was eight weeks, so four hours a day I would be sitting there listening to Morse code and trying to remember the various characters and trying to keep up until I was able to send and receive 26 words a minute in Morse code. The other four hours, I was learning how to type because I was also being trained to operate a teletype machine. They don't even have them anymore. But at the time, you may see uh, things in movies where uh, you see this machine typing out a message. It's a teletype machine. And set up with either landlines or through a radio network, you typed up a message and then Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, but paper tape with holes punched in it, okay? So you would sit there and you would type up your message and the machine would turn it into this strip of paper with holes punched in it. And once you were done, then you would contact whoever it was you needed to contact by radio. Um, so while being stationed at Fort Clayton, what was like the toughest part about your job and also like the most interesting? <clears throat> the toughest part of my job? Aside from being a long way from home, the toughest part of my job was if something went wrong. And I had to get it fixed. That was the hard part because I had a lot of people interrupting me to tell me to hurry up. And that was the difficult part of it because I knew what I was doing, I knew what I had to do, but it was going to take time to get it done. For instance, uh, the radios had to be tuned to certain frequencies. And there's a whole procedure you go through when you're tuning in a radio and locking it into a frequency. Because we had uh, communications with each of the units in our battalion, 
with the main headquarters, with uh, other units. We had Air Force and our command post. You've seen uh, pictures of air traffic controllers. We had two air traffic controllers there, Air Force personnel, who were watching all the flights in and out and putting the strips of paper in the slots. And they had radios also that were part of the equipment in the back room that I had never seen before. And also I had to learn how to operate and how to set up. Did it take long to learn how to do all that? It just took time. Uh, probably with a basic training on how to uh, set up a radio. Uh, they were already set up anyway. Just, you know, from time to time checking and uh, what's called regular maintenance, I would go through and reset each radio just to make sure it was in the proper, the proper operating uh, condition. Actually, it, uh, it wasn't uh, all that difficult. I, I took a, you know, a little time to to adjust. Now my uh, family had moved since I was uh, away, so uh, I had to, you know, make a new home for myself. So I was starting out and that uh, part of the life where you change from one thing to another, which I had to do going from civilian life to the Army, and then going back to civilian life, and there's not anybody telling you you have to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and you have to do this and you have to do that. You're, now you're on your own. Now you have to make yourself get up in time to go ready for work. All right. Um, have you kept in contact with all of your fellow veterans from the time you served? I only uh, kept contact with uh, the one that uh, uh, lived in Oxnard, and that uh, he got busy with his life. I got busy with mine, but. Uh, you know, I kept contact with him for maybe a year, but uh, after that we each went our own ways. And as I say, uh, he lived in Oxnard, I lived in the San Fernando Valley, so distance was a big factor. He had his job, his family, I had mine. <laughs>